Hello. I'm having a go at that Irish twist that Giz doesn't rave about, so uh, he, gave, he gave it us and he said, uh, this is great, I don't like it. But to be honest, I, I really don't mind. I think there's not wrong with it at all. But uh, I wanted to have a chat with you today about something, well, it's a story of two parts, really. In some of the videos, uh, when we're pissing about with our pipes and shit, you may have seen me produce this rather grubby, tatty uh, clay pipe. Obviously, cheaply produced and uh, unusual. And I thought to myself, you know, what's the story behind this thing? Well, it's a clay pipe, and it was manufactured by a guy called Samuel McLardy. Now, he was born in Glasgow in 1842, and he was the son of a tobacconist and pipe manufacturer. And in 1895, he moved down to Manchester to set up his own factory. And using a clay mould, he made these clay pipes. And they became very, very popular. So much so that he was producing in the region of five million a year. So, obviously, they're uh, quite prolific of the time. And he continued to manufacture these pipes up until... 1910 when the clay pipe started to fall out of favour beginning you know the production began to wane and people went towards more uh elaborate wooden calf pipes but uh any road so we're looking at a pipe here that's over 110 years old okay remarkable that it's still in one piece But, as I said, this is a story that's in two parts. A remarkable pipe, still fully usable, made of clay, so it's got a degree of fragility. Fragility? Fra it could be breakable, but it's lasted over a hundred years. A hundred years. 110 years, okay? Anyway, that's not what makes it good. Let me show you something else. Ordinary tin box, you think, made of brass. Okay. Unremarkable in itself until you turn it over. Now, you may not know what this is. If you've not seen one before, you wouldn't have any reason to know. Okay. That's, that's Princess Mary. She was George V's daughter. And in 1914, when she was 17, and of course, World War I had started, she thought... It would be uh, nice if the lads who were away from home fighting for the king and empire would receive something special for Christmas Day. So she set up a fund called the uh, Princess Mary Christmas Fund to enable all the soldiers and sailors in the sea to receive a nice gift for Christmas. <coughs> so they arranged to manufacture these tins and send them out to the troops. Now, if you were a smoker... You had a choice of cigarettes. If you're a pipe smoker, you had a pipe and uh, 10 ounces of baccy. If you weren't a smoker, you could either have sweets. They had, well, I don't say you could, you could have. You could choose having sweets or uh, a writing kit. And some of the Commonwealth troops from the foreign places that uh, didn't really approve of smoking and the like, they received uh, sweets and spices to jazz up the food. Very noble. Very interesting. Unfortunately, production costs and delivery and the expansion of the war, etc., prevented a majority of these being delivered by Christmas Day. So they extended it from not only 1914, but throughout the war. And it's rumoured that even in 1920, some of the troops who had returned home, who hadn't received their tin, still received one. Which, she made good on a promise. She made sure all the British troops, or as she said, everybody wearing the King's uniform, Got a special treat for Christmas. So there we are. The Princess Mary tin. Now. Unremarkable. But as I said. You had the choice of what was in your tin. And when I got this. I popped it open. It's quite well sealed. Because uh, 
she made it well sealed so it would be dry so any important papers or tobacco and everything would would stay dry and safe so they didn't get damaged so let's pop her open now inside she made sure that everyone received a Christmas greeting from home so they were given a little card I don't know if you can read that there we go I'll just read it to you if you can it says uh, with best wishes for a happy Christmas and a victorious new year from the Princess Mary and friends at home so the plan was 1914 all the soldiers got a Christmas gift from home and even got a little photograph of Princess Mary there she is look okay but as I said some of them came with tobacco and a pipe and this particular tin had this inside it which as you can see is the same as this now wouldn't it be wonderful to think that a soldier away from home sat in the trenches in the First World War in France and Flanders would be sat there chugging away on his pipe Christmas morning. And all this grub and dirt is the soil from the trenches that was on his hands and he had it in his hands while he was chugging away. This is why I like history so much because no matter what it is, it's got a little story behind it. I hope this wasn't boring for you. I don't know it was a bit longer than the ones I normally send out. But there you go. Miniature McLardy, Samuel McLardy pipe. Over a hundred years old. Found in a Mary tin. That came back from the First World War. Lovely. Amazing. Enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, we've come to Bolton. And uh, we just had a nice breakfast. Uh, it's a bit of a laugh actually in there. Uh, some woman going mental, putting her hands all over the cutlery, and then some guy comes in demanding food. So it's typical that we come to a place like this and that happens. Anyway, Bolton, it's uh, North Manchester, and a uh, very big town, very big town, very famous for mills, I think, and things like that. Working class. Anyway, we're, we're, on a, we're on the hunt for Arthur Morris Tobacconist. Apparently he's a smart tobacconist around here somewhere. But, yeah, we're having a look around. Lots of vape shops, lots of dodgy people, actually. It's See you in a bit. everywhere, Bob. Who's this? Samuel Crompton. Samuel Crompton. The spinning mule, the spinning jenny. Remember all that? He was from Bolton. You can't whack the old ar architecture of the old English and well, British Empire. Amazing the architecture. I mean, just look at this place. Yeah, look at that. It's glorious. Bolton Town Hall. It's glorious. You know, they built that when everyone was skinned and people had nothing on their feet. Yeah, they had enough money to build something like that. That's pure capitalism for you, isn't it? Not that I'm a communist. Now look at this. That's a proper war memorial, that is. The divine in memory of the men and women in Bolton who gave their lives in the Great War, 1914. 1919 and then 1939 to 45. Why is it 1919? I thought the Great War ended in 1918. That's to mean people after trod on the old uh, landmine or something. Wow. So I'm having a good time. It's been in a music shop, that was quite good. In the evening on Saturday around here it's pretty chaotic because these bars have a lot of bands on. And we're gonna go and find a tobacco shop now. Ah, 
for Morris. It's a garbage. Yeah, it's not tobacco in here, look. Hey, look. Hold on, Thomas. This is a really great tobacco nest. Look at all this. What's it called? Market Gate? Uh, Bradshaw. Bradshaw Gate. Yeah. Bradshaw Gate in Bolton. Quite rare now, aren't they, tobacco nests? We've got all the aromatics. Hey, James. <laughs> Bob. We're in Bolton. During the Civil War, Bolton reside, was, was besieged for price and taken once with much slaughter. 1651, James, 7th Earl of Derby, beheaded near this spot. Yes, this is it. This is uh, where he had his head chopped off. Outside this pub, the man inside. Oh, so it happened here. It's where he had his head cut off. Can you imagine being dragged out and stick your head on a thing and have it chopped off on the side? There he is. This old pub. They say it's haunted. Very flipping haunted. Look at it. Any of rock bands on it. Bit of history for you, Bob. Outside the Man and Scythe pub. Apparently, during the Civil War, Bolton was a, a parliamentary town and uh, it got besieged by the Earl of Derby from Bury and he, he was uh, a royalist and there was many, much slaughter and uh, basically what happened when Cromwell got in power the, or whatever he, he got arrested the Earl of Derby and he brought him here and he chopped his head off with a scythe but there's another twist to this because later on when the crown was restored, the executioner that chopped his head off also had his head chopped off. And his head is in a like display case, fish tank, in a pub called the Pack Horse in Atherside. Not far from where I live. I must go and have a look at it sometime. I have seen it. It's just a skull, as it would be. There's a copy of his head. Big axe. Yeah, he's proper execution his axe, that is. He's probably needs a, a French pipe. That's what he needs. Well a nice way to finish uh, the history history lesson. Today's history lessons. <clears throat> from Bob and myself a nice pint of cider in the man and side it's supposed to be altered this place what a funny noise correction I've just read that uh, the executioner uh, didn't have his head cut off he actually died had a uh, what they actually did was they dug his body up and chopped his head off then as a as a revenge and his and his head as I say it's in that pub the pack horse in Afferside. But what kind of society does that eh? Oh let's let's dig him up and chop his head off. They did that with Cromwell though didn't they I think. Anyway, enough of it, enough of me.